Carr, here with Matt Huber. We're here in uh, Peoria, Illinois, at the uh, World War II Comes Alive uh, reenactment. We're uh, members of the 167th Signal Photo Company, HRS. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, equipment that we're using today. Uh, this uh, is pretty much parallels what was being used in the European theater by combat photographers. Combat uh, photographers in the uh, European theater were organized into five-man combat units. A uh, junior officer in charge primarily of making sure that uh, exposed film got uh, out, fresh film got in, the men got billeted and fed, and uh, two uh, individuals assigned as still photographers, which uh, Matt and I are representing today. There were also two uh, people as assigned as uh, motion picture uh, photographers. Military, uh, for official record purposes, wanted everything on large format film. They wanted the best fidelity available. So, uh, combat photographers in the field were issued uh, 4x5 speed graphic cameras, which is what uh, Matt's holding here. It's a 4x5 inch piece of sheet film. And uh, the motion picture guys were handling 35mm uh, IMO uh, Bell and Howell cameras. For the unofficial, off the record stuff, the uh, General's awards ceremony, uh, dinner party, uh, that type of thing. Uh, the, uh, they were issued 35mm uh, uh, Leicas, which I'm holding here, or a 35mm uh, Kodak, and a 16mm uh, Filmo Bell & Howell camera. All of the uh, film that was shot in the European theater uh, was, for official record purposes, was flown back to uh, England for processing and sent back through channels. The, uh, Unofficial stuff uh, was handled uh, by the uh, lab that was back at uh, company headquarters uh, for the 167th that would have been initially in Verdun and then finally in the uh, spot towards the end of the war. Uh, combat units in the field were also uh, equipped with vehicles in the case of uh, 167th. Uh, each combat unit uh, had a uh, jeep with a trailer and a uh, three-quarter ton weapons carrier. Typically, uh, photo assignments would uh, go out and cameramen would be paired up, one uh, still photo uh, photographer with a motion picture photographer on one of the vehicles, with uh, one of the individuals staying back to uh, maintain the uh, headquarters uh, wherever they've set up in a uh, civilian uh, housing that they were billeted in or a tent or wherever they managed to uh, find shelter for the uh, period of time that they were, you know, given area. Uh, the uh, film emulsions at the time were not very fast, not uh, what we'd experience today uh, using digital or even the latest films. Uh, typically uh, you don't see a lot of color film from the European theater. And the reason for that is that color film at the time had a uh, ASA speed of only 25 and uh, you really needed bright sun to properly expose that film. Uh, there wasn't a lot of days of uh, bright, sunny uh, weather in, uh, in Europe at the time. So the best film uh, speed available at the time was 100, and uh, that was in black and white. That's primarily what we shot. Uh, when you look at uh, footage from uh, the Pacific, you see a lot more color because obviously a lot of sunny weather, and they had the... Uh, so it, it wasn't done for economics. The government never... Uh, Enters economics it. it was uh, simply a matter of uh, what uh, served the uh, weather conditions uh, based on uh, the technology of the time. So, basic operation of the uh, speed graphic camera. Uh, there were uh, two viewfinders, a, a wire viewfinder that uh, provided a, a, f a fairly uh, fast but uh, tight image of, of the uh, frame, uh, left a lot of the uh, film area uh, out of the frame it was used for quick shots and then a uh, optical viewfinder that uh, was more accurate in, in terms of uh, filling the uh, actual size of the image. Focus was done with a rangefinder mounted to the side of the camera and uh, the focusing uh, gear mechanism here and uh, the lens being cocked and uh, tripped using a uh, either manually with the uh, finger or if uh, the uh, flash was attached there's a solenoid that would allow the uh, flash to uh, trip the uh, 
the lens as well. Uh, film was carried in a 12-sheet uh, film pack, uh, very similar to maybe what uh, a lot of you remember as uh, the old Polaroids where you'd have to pull the tab. So there were 12 tabs that you could pull and uh, get each one of your frames. And uh, for each shot that you took, you had to uh, not only be the cameraman, but you also had to be the, uh, the reporter as well. You had to write the caption for every uh, piece of film you took, so you needed to do the every shot that you took. You uh, needed to uh, write a caption to accompany that as well. So uh, you'd take your notes in the field, and uh, when you got back to uh, wherever you were billeted for the uh, night, you'd uh, do your write-ups on the uh, triplicate forms and submit those uh, along with the exposed film pack back through channels and uh, when the film was processed and uh, prints were finally made, the uh, captions as you had written them uh, would be uh, printed on the back of each one of the uh, contact proofs that were distributed to the various uh, governmental offices and news agencies at the time, wire agencies. Hi, <laughs> my name is Pete, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I been making art for a very long time in a lot of different ways and thought I'd combine my interest in World War II history with my interest in art and uh, reading a lot about the different war artists and correspondents that contributed to the war effort through their artwork. Uh, I thought I'd come out and try and do a little field painting and drawing at the Rockford event this year. So it's the first time I've tried kind of a field easel and I know as long as the weather is good I can probably paint outdoors. Um, a lot of these artists I've studied, they wouldn't paint like this in the field quite so much as they would work in their studios, but this type of a sketch, plain air painting, will work uh, for that type of thing. And these war artists did so many things by way of illustration, propaganda posters, recruiting posters, war bond posters, uh, paintings for the war effort to bring the war effort back, bring the war back home to the public and kind of illustrate different sides that the photography can't always capture. Uh, some of these illustrations I've done just of, you know, soldiers in the field, um, just to capture more of those subjective sides of soldiers and, you know, bring, bring some emotion into these portraitures that um, the, the folks back at home might be able to see. Um, I've also done some other pen and ink pieces that might be good for magazine or book illustrations. Uh, these types of things could be done pretty easily in the field. Um, I've done some other portraits of you know, different servicemen and even just some quick charcoal sketches of men out in the field. And these could be just the artist's observation of what was happening you know, in his area at the time as a record of what was happening. Um, or it could be something more specific to you know, work up a sketch that might be turned into a war bond poster later on. But these are just a few of the war related things I've done recently. But I just thought it's an interesting way of bringing some art out here to this kind of history in World War II. Thank you. That sounds perfect. You're welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Allenkoff. I'm a U.S. Navy uh, reservist out of Seattle. I'm, uh, it's my fourth year here at uh, War Two Days at, uh, at Midway Village, and I'm a, I do, I'm a War Two combat camera uh, historian, and I have various different um, various different uh, collections of War Two military uh, camera gear. Anyway, anything that ranges from uh, the U.S. Army Single Corps uh, combat camera, Army Air Corps. Uh, Army Air Corps. Uh, uh, camera gear to Navy. Navy photographers me. Which this directly relates to my job in the Navy. The history behind my job is I'm a Navy photojournalist. Yes, part of the we have an IMO, 35mm motion picture IMO. Speed graphics down here, 4x5. Uh, try to take my time. Uh, Kodak 620 Kodak Metalist. Another IMO. This is a single lens IMO. Uh, 35 millimeter, plus 35 millimeter, uh, bump, 35 millimeter bump spotting camera. 4x5 combat graphic. They were used by the Navy Marine Corps. Cine Kodak Special, used by the US Navy. 
16 millimeter. Another speed graphic used by the Marine Corps early in, early in the war. Uh, U.S. Navy 4x5 speed graphic. Graphics K20 aerial camera. Graphic uh, speed graphic round type C3. Space liquid for the uh, Army Air Corps. Single core PH47F model. This is the PH47E model. Uh, two are the same, but the lenses were different. That's the only different difference in the different type of uh, cameras. Down here we have uh, two different types of gun cameras. This was very heavily modified, as you see. But the normal, normally, they were just a single lens, and they were actually fitted in the wing of, a, of an airplane uh, with various uh, mirrors and prisms. So whenever they fired, they would be able to uh, uh, see either blown up tanks or train cars, whatever else, they were, whatever, they were whatever they were firing at. Uh, each camera is actually has its own kit. It's, and within the kit, it has, of course, its own manual. You can, you, you can, within the manual, it tells you everything that goes with it, how to service it, and how to how to actually work the camera. Um, coming back to the camera collection, we have uh, a lot of other various cameras here. Uh, on the ship, the U.S. Navy had to had to use a smaller camera. This is actually a 16 millimeter. Uh, Cine Kodak, uh, very small and compact as you see. Um, coming down here, we have a high altitude Navy uh, camera that you can either shoot these from the aircraft or the deck of a ship on the that would have been attached to a railing. Uh, they were mostly used to shoot bombardments, troop tro 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 movements onto the beach. Uh, very heavy and bulky. <laughs> Um, moving on here, uh, this is a 35 millimeter uh, IMO motion picture camera made by Bell and Howell. Uh, Free Force World War II was shot with this type of camera. Um, most, most of the film footage you see from the ground troops in, in, in Europe, uh, all the footage was filmed with this type of camera. Uh, this one dates to 1943. Um, the magazine in the back here fits 400 feet of film. The motor here is a 12 volt and it runs off of a 12 volt battery on the ground. Since zoom lenses weren't invented until after the war, until after World War II, you had a what's called a spider mount. So each lens was actually a prime lens, 50, 75, 100, 100 millimeter. So there was no zoom at all. And then you look through it. Um, you'd have your perspective lenses, perspective uh, viewfinders to compensate for the lens. You move it on here, uh, you have your IMO kit, the box, the kit, the, the kit case that it came in with the different, um, with the oil to service it, and some lens caps, the filters, and the other various different uh, lenses and accessories. Of course, you had to have the manual for it too. Uh, uh, moving on here, we have the uh, Keystone Naval F8 aerial camera, very heavy. Uh, you were able to. Uh, this is mostly an aerial camera shot from the plane. Uh, but the yellow lens was to increase uh, sky contrast, and the yellow red lens was to increase the overall crop contrast using uh, black mirror. No, that's fine, no, actually. Uh, this is actually is on loan to me. <laughs> it's not mine. Uh, moving on here, uh, this is uh, Tech Sergeant Gilmore. He's actually uh, in, the, in the unit that I portrayed, the 167th uh, Signal Photo Company. Uh, he was actually a motion picture photographer during, during the war. This is a recent eBay find, uh, but it's a fantastic display item. Um, doing some research about it, it's really fantastic. Um, he lived to be 79 years old, died in uh, 1988. I've been collecting for about seven years, but doing this for over 10. Um, three forces collections off of eBay.